Welcome to Monday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us again today and for another week. Week number eight of our series we've entitled Just As If Sin Never Existed. And of course, we've also called this a rest area. This is a rest area off of the main course we've been on all year on Highway 316. We started talking about the unconditional uh, immeasurable, inseparable, unfailing love of God. And we really saw how God's unconditional love is really what caused us to be saved out of our condition. And we talked about grace and what that means to us. That there's The grace of God is more abundant uh, than sin and the fall of man. Then we talked about grace and faith. Grace is God's part. That's what He did for us that we could not do for ourselves. That's what He gives to us in Christ that we can never earn by our own merits. But then our faith is involved in receiving and taking what God has already made available through His grace. But we've, for the last number of weeks, uh, just gotten off on the rest there and began to talk about what does this life look like in Christ? What does a life without sin look like? And I tell you, that is what the new covenant is all about. And, you know, a lot of these scriptures that we've kind of looked at, read over, and overlooked uh, in, in the New, New Testament, a lot of Paul's writings, because we're really not seeing these things through the eyes of grace, through the eyes of God. See, if we're still looking at this thing as being a work from man to God, we're never going to get to these conclusions and these realities here. But when you begin to look at it, from a finished work, a perspective that God has, a finished work in Christ, from Him to us through His grace, then it all becomes possible right there. And that's what that's why we, we come into a place of accepting these realities right here that we're talking about. Otherwise, you're going to say, there ain't no way. That guy, he don't know what he's talking about. Well, I do know what I'm talking about because God knows what He's talking about and we're reading right out of the New Covenant, right out of what He said in His Word. Now I want to go over to some scriptures we looked at last week out of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51 once again. And we've, we've looked at these recently, I believe last week, maybe even the week before, I don't remember. But uh, I've looked at them so much in our church, we, we've really gone over these so much that I don't know exactly what I said when, okay? <laughs> But Isaiah chapter 51, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 in their entirety because we, we've already kind of gone through this verse by verse and given some commentary on it. But I want to go through this and show you the pattern of this right here. And then we're going to move into what we're going to talk about this week. But uh, Isaiah 51 in verse 1, it says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord... Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and from the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone, or while he was one. That's literally what it says. And I blessed him, and I increased him. Verse 3 goes on to say, For the Lord will comfort Zion. Now he's talking about us. We're Zion, okay? The Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all of her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be, will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Now that we've read this in entirety, let's, let's look back and, and just take an overview of what the pattern right here. And really, this is the pattern of redemption, these first three verses in order. I want you to see in verse number one, he says, listen to me. God is telling us to listen to Him. You see, the New Covenant is all about hearing. That's what we've been emphasizing here. Entering into the rest of God is, first of all, about hearing. Hearing the right message. Hearing the gospel of the finished work of God in Christ. And then believing that. Mixing our faith with it. So he says, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Now, he is not talking about your works of righteousness first and foremost. Now, those will be included in that. But that's not the root. Our works of righteousness are not the root. He's talking about a root of righteousness. And in fact, in context, he's talking about Abraham. If there's one thing Abraham learned, is one thing all of us should have learned through the pattern of the Old Testament, is no matter how good we keep the law, we're never going to be perfect enough to earn or deserve our own righteousness. 
God knew that. That's why he that's why he already gave his son before the foundation of the world. That's why it requires a sacrifice just as Jesus, the lamb of God without spot or blemish to take place because God knew that we could never earn our own righteousness. How now now that looks like a predicament there if you don't look at the whole picture because God provides us his righteousness free of charge just simply by believing on Jesus, by trusting in God and not trusting in our own self. And see, that's really what he's talking about. He's not talking about, you better get busy, you better start behaving and doing things right. No, those are fruits of righteousness. But before you have fruits, you have to have a root. And this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about our self-righteousness that we obtain by works. Because again, Abraham found that out. Remember Romans chapter 4 that we've already been over. This is what Abraham found out. Abraham found out that his own self-righteous works were not going to make it. That if he would just simply believe God and trust in Him, God would provide a righteousness that was perfect because it, because it came from Him. It originated from God Himself. And that God would treat Him just as if sin never existed. And that's really what righteousness is. It means right standing with God. It means to be justified. That God sees us and treats us just as if sin never existed in our life. And see, that's the way we have to see ourselves. We have to see ourselves in His righteousness, not trying to work and obtain our own righteousness with God. That'll never, you'll never get there that way. So he says, you who follow after righteousness. So again, he's talking about the righteousness that Abraham found out, that he discovered, the righteousness of God that is received by faith. He said, you who seek after the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the hole of the pit from which you were dug. So I want you to see in verse 1 that before any of this other thing, these other things happen in verse 2 and 3, God had to restore righteousness to us. He had to provide a right standing with himself and that is simply having a right relationship with God. And we've already looked at these aspects right here. In fact, we not only are just kind of brought back into a friendly, uh, you know, relationship with God, we have been born of God. He is our Father. We're His children. We're in the family of God. We're His own. So that is much closer than just a bosom buddy that you meet that you're, you know, you're in favor with. That's not what He's talking about. We have the closest kind of relationship and righteousness that you can possibly get. And having this kind of, you know, sonship, or you could say daughtership. And when we say sonship, that's male and female. You understand that. Being sons or daughters of God, being children of God, you could not have that kind of status. You couldn't be born of God and still be in sin, still have sin attached. You, you couldn't be righteous and in right standing with God and, and be, you know... Uh, have a lot of unjust things going on in your life, having a record of sin still existing in your life. So this is a perfect, complete righteousness he's talking about. This is the kind of righteousness that was uh, put into Abraham's account when he believed the gospel message just like you and I do. Now notice, once that righteousness is restored to us, verse number 2 takes place. He says, Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone, or while he was one, and I blessed him, and I increased him. Now, you could say that Abraham and Sarah, Sarah particularly in her womb, were barren. And you know, they were barren younger in life, and as they got older, and in fact, you know, this is, uh, they didn't start their family together until Abraham was about 100 years old, and Sarah about 90. So you're not just talking about a lifelong barrenness, you're also talking about age kicking in right here. This is naturally impossible. And actually, that condition right there of barrenness, not having children, uh, it, you know, to these two right here, that was considered part of the fallout of the fall. That is considered a part of the curse. And we read last week in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, the redemptive reality. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And then it goes on in verse 14 says, That the blessing of Abraham might come upon us in Christ Jesus as we have received the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
So notice that we are redeemed from the curse. See, the curse, the sin, the fall of man brought in the curse, and the curse resulted in decrease, death, and destruction. Decrease, death, and destruction. And remember, we looked at last week, it, it, you know, when uh, Ab uh, Adam sinned and fell, you know, he had to be extracted from the garden so he could not eat off of the tree of life and live forever in that condition. God did not want man, mankind living forever in that condition. So he had to separate man away from that tree of life so he wouldn't partake of it and eat, eat of that tree and, and live forever under sin and the fall and the curse. That would be horrible right there. But after he was, uh, he, he sinned and fell, then God said the ground is cursed for your sake and you're going to have thorns and thistles growing up rather than the good stuff you've been partaking of in the garden. And then you're going to have to toil and sweat and, and just have hard labor. And you're not going to get a whole lot out of the soil. Not like God intended. See, we can work in, in our gardens and stuff like that. We can get some produce out of it. But I can tell you, it is nothing like God intended. And under the curse, it's hard to grow stuff. And then you have to constantly weed things. have to constantly water things because you, you have that periods of rain and then drought and all that kind of stuff going on. So we're seeing the curse at, at, at that point right there. And all of this stuff, spirit, soul, body, financially, all of it was affected. All, every part, aspect of our life was affected negatively by the curse. But thank God Jesus redeemed us from the curse. Now I know I heard somebody trying to make a distinction. They said, well, you know, that's the curse of the law, not the curse of the fall. Let me, let me tell you something. It's the same thing. <laughs> I can tell you it is the exact same thing. Christ redeemed us from all of it. And you're going to see this in just a minute as we go through this, that that is indeed the case. But thank God we weren't redeemed from the blessing. No, we were restored unto the blessing. And I want you to see that Abraham and Sarah, while they were barren in their own state under that curse, under the fall of man, that God instituted a covenant with him and pronounced a blessing on him. Now remember what that blessing means. That blessing is God's enablement and empowerment for us to succeed and prosper in every endeavor, in every area of our life. And that would include spirit, soul, body, again, financially, everything that we put our hand to, God's blessing is on it, His empowerment, His enablement on it. In other words, He puts His resources, His strength, His power, His ability behind us in that blessing in order to cause us and empower us to succeed in those endeavors in life. And see, with God's blessing on Abraham and Sarah, they, want, they went from being the father and the mother of none to being the father and mother of many nations. I tell you, that is awesome. This is what's going on. Once righteousness is restored, again, that's the pattern we see over in the New Testament. Uh, Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, we looked at it, that God justifies the ungodly. Then He restores the blessing to us. And I tell you, once that blessing is restored, then things start to manifest good in our life. Now again, let me insert that it's not just because of what God has made for us available in grace and in the blessing is going to automatically happen. Now we have to understand that our faith is involved. Our faith has to receive what God has already done and provided in Christ Jesus. If you don't ever use your faith, then those things are not going to manifest in this life. doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. It just means in this particular life, you're not going to see a whole lot of manifestation of the blessing of God in your life. Now, go, let's look on down before we run out of time today to verse 3 again. That we'll probably have to pick up here again tomorrow. But he says, but the, uh, for the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all of her waste places. Now again, when he's talking about comforting, he's not just talking about having pity for her and feeling sorry for us. No, there's a difference between sympathy that, you know, we kind of give sympathy to people. And that's good. We, we need to do that. But there's a difference between that and compassion. See, Jesus was moved not just with sympathy, sympathy, but with compassion. Compassion means you got the power to do something about that situation. That's really what he's talking about with comfort right here. He's talking about God moving in on the scene and doing something about uh, this particular, to turn this situation around in our life. Now notice he says, I'll comfort all of her waste places. 
Then he says, and uh, goes on to say, and I will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Now notice right there, he's talking about the uh, Eden and the garden of the Lord. Now what is that talking about? He's talking about the garden of Eden. Now he's not specifically talking about having a literal garden of Eden, I don't think, but what he's talking about is us going back to pre-fall days. In other words, the way things were originally, the way God put it in motion, the way he set it up, He's, he is returning and restoring us back to that condition because, first of all, we've been restored to right relationship with Him, righteousness. Second of all, the blessing has been restored, His confirmment on us to cause us to succeed and prosper in life. And then in verse 3, He's talking about turning waste places, wilderness, as, and deserts. So what are those? Things left barren by the curse. By the curse. He's talking about getting rid of the curse and His blessing being restoring us back to a pre-fall day state with God and the way things should be in our life. Well, unfortunately, I'm out of time. We're going to have to just pick up there tomorrow. i got a lot more to say about that this week as we move through this. If you'd like additional materials, go to TonyCowan.org, and we will see you tomorrow.